All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Dave and Lois Cho. We're at Six Peaks Winery in Silverton. It's July 23rd, 2020. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, first question, and most important question for our purposes, is why wine? That's a good question. <laughs> Lois asked me that a couple days ago. So like, like, why wine, Dave? <laughs> yeah. uh, wine is, uh, is community for me. And then uh, I'll explain that in a second. And then in all my upbringing, uh, everything I've done last 35 years uh, kind of led me to uh, winemaking and then the whole aspect culture of wine. Um, I guess, uh, what, I mean. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, a lot of our um, story has been revolved around joining around the table and eating meals with friends and family and neighbors. And mm -hmm. you started, um, I mean, where do you want to start? <laughs> well, yeah, well, it's a long story, but yeah. I guess trying to make it succinct as possible. I don't know if possible, but I was born in South Korea um, and uh, grew up with a big family, but my family decided to move to Canada when, I, when we were young, uh, me and my brother. And then, uh, so grew up in Vancouver, Canada, which is also a beautiful place to live. And now we're here uh, well, first in California, and then we moved up to Oregon to study wine, and and we, we recently moved back to California actually for a family. Um, so in all those changes, I've kind of a nomad lifestyle, you know. Like first move wasn't my choice, you know. It was I was young enough, it's like oh we're going to Canada, what's that? <laughs> you know, all right, we're, we're going to Canada. So, um, but all those different changes kind of. The table, like, was kind of the integral part of it, and you know that was something that was consistent in my life. And then sharing good food and drinks among family and friends, uh, that kind of kept me. I thought this is like this is consistent. This is uh, where I feel welcome. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I didn't drink wine when I was a kid, or uh, as an immigrant family, uh, we had a restaurant, so I grew up peeling potatoes in the back or what have you I mean I was pretty slow I'm sure my mom's you know uh, but um, we drew it grew up mostly near food and table more so than the wine and that culture that came a little bit later um, well what else I can talk about it I mean <laughs> well, and then you I mean so he was in when we first met we were up in Canada and so they had immigrated up to Canada and then um, we moved to California in like 2007 and got married. He was in seminary when I met him. So, so I was in, studying theology. Yeah, he was in theology. And so when we met, that's really the track that he was going on. But knew sort of like that there was something that was missing for you, right? And so mm -hmm. during that time, like um, in seminary, uh, one of the, our good friends, he was a... Um, this whole really avid home brewer. Yeah, home brewer. And yeah. we really got Dave into like craft brewing the and micro brewing. brewing scene over there and so like you know we would play Catan every night and like all the grad students would get together and we would um and like share beer and so like i feel like even in seminary that's sort of where he sort of got into like mm -hmm. drinks mm -hmm. and then um and then there was a time when you were trying to figure out like what you were going to do and then when uh, you end up going to france mm -hmm. to which is like a monastic community there and then you know there's south, south there. burgundy and then um i didn't know but that was right before i, was, I got into wine i drink beer but so i'm in burgundy I'm like drinking beer <laughs> <laughs> it's almost sacrilegious yeah. yeah so i mean i drank some wine but i didn't know what i was drinking i just I drank whatever the tavern had, you know, these these shows have it, you know, it's table wine. I just ordered wine by craft and just chugged it, it was hot. <laughs> um, and then even there too, like looking at the monks, like working the land and like the self-sustained kind of community thing. Um, again, the table, they, a lot of people, a lot of volunteers come all, all over the Europe and then they just, um, work towards one goal and then just have that sustainable community and then um it's, and it's like this group pretty much these groups of people from all over the world who are in the christian community but come to sort of as like a um, like a pilgrimage to come and just sort of experience like the simplistic life mm -hmm. and so i was working as a nurse at the time so i'm like 
funding all his, like trying to figure out what he's doing at <laughs> his sugar mama. Yes. And then he like, he, um, he went, he was sort of trying to figure out, like he was in seminary and not really sure like if this was what he wanted to continue doing. Mm -hmm. So he was mm -hmm. playing music and really into like worship leading and like playing music there. And so that's how he sort of got into music. And then mm -hmm. that time he was sort of as a sort of soul searching career trip. I was like, just go to France. You wanted to do this when you're in Bible college. Why don't you, this is your opportunity, just go. Mm -hmm. So he goes and like, yeah, it's just a very simple, like people from all over the world get together and they share meals together. They all like prepare the meals together. And then mm -hmm. he did like a week of silence. And so like the whole week of silence. That was intense. Yeah, he like goes <laughs> and he like, you don't talk to anyone, but you all prepare meals together at the same time. You live with like 10 guys. Yeah. But we, yeah, we don't talk. It's yeah, more focusing on like down. your inner self or like, like you, you know, yeah. A meal and then yeah. You, like, share the meal together and so like I think I feel like when you came back from that trip you were telling me how like that really shaped like how you felt about like the table and just mm -hmm. how the power of a meal and sharing a simple like bottle of table wine mm -hmm. and I feel like that was sort of like a transition for you don't you feel like? I think so no I think so it definitely like left a huge impact on me and just by I mean no words exchanged but just by being there together it was it was big enough to like overwhelm me like in you know kind of experience and then and then I kind of it was like you know I'm still searching but it was part of that like I guess crux to like oh maybe I should not just stay in seminary or you know study theology and then I'll just you know go to the next step and then you know do more searching and then I was writing songs and uh, playing music, you know, open mics, you know, everywhere. And you released an album. <laughs> well, self-recorded album. <laughs> it sounds awesome. <laughs> I think. Uh, and then um, I started playing uh, out on the streets in like uh, in Santa Monica, you know, uh, playing my songs, cover songs, what have you, whatever get, will get me more tips, you know, at the end of the day. And I just did that for a while, and then not until, and then someone approached me while I was doing that, and hey, you want to play for my winery? And then it's like, he said, we'll pay you. It's like, wow, you pay me? That's great. No one has ever paid me for music before. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then I went there. I, I can still have my tip jar out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, sure, you can have your tip jar out. And, um, and then, yeah, and then while I was playing, they was, hey, what do, you, what do you want? I was like, what do you mean what I want? I was like, a glass of wine? I was like, sure. <laughs> and it was a simple gesture like that. But, um, and then I, from then on, I maybe play for different wineries around in Temecula area mm -hmm. uh, for about like three years. And then I got to taste a whole bunch of different wines. And then I guess my, uh, curiosity like start growing and then it was I was totally intrigued and you know got the bug yeah everything and then next my next move was the smartest move I've ever, ever, ever done <laughs> so I volunteer for a harvest <laughs> it's not very in hindsight we're like you could have totally gotten paid <laughs> like, yeah why'd you volunteer yeah 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 so I think I still to this day I think that was the best move <laughs> I remember, remember when the first time, his first day at the winery, he yeah. lost your car keys. So he's like, punch. I wasn't doing punch downs. Yeah. And then I had my keys in my uh, in my pocket. <laughs> it was kind of loose pants, and then I trying to. Uh, like I didn't realize at the, at the time, but I went to grab my lunch from in the car, and then where's my key? I yeah, couldn't so find he it. Yeah. And I'm at work, and he's like, I can't find my car keys. Like you have to come and get me. Like I yeah. can't. Yeah. I don't know where they are. The first day I was pretty nervous. <laughs> Next but, day. Anyway. They flattened the keys. It floated up to the top. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you to fermentation and CO2. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, man. got my car key back. So uh, well, why are we talking about this? So, <laughs> so you got it, and after that, I mean, that's how you got into wine. So you volunteered, or you volunteered. You, the harvest, and then, and then after that, they, because I could count, they were like, do you want a lab tech position? What is that? <laughs> I don't even think he knew it was called a lab tech. You're like, what's your? What's my you want to work in the lab? Like, I just work in the lab. Is that a job? You gotta pay me. He's like, yes, we will pay you. Yeah. <laughs> and 
so then, yeah, that's how you sort of... Yeah, and that's how I got my start. And then they taught me, it was very old lab, everything hand titrating, doing a, a formaldehyde, you know, metal act ch checkups and stuff. It's, you know, mouse pipe, no, not my... <laughs> done some moss pipetting <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah that's how I got my start and then I worked there for a couple of years um, as a lab tech I can you can call it uh, but my interest grew I knew I think the, the frustration I had at the time was I knew how to do all the analysis you know they taught me as I was a trained monkey I, I don't know how to do exactly I was pre precise but I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing so I asked my boss, hey, what's my next step? So either, you yeah, you go to school or you stick around longer you st until you understand. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I don't want to stick around too long. <laughs> I want to learn, like, why now? Mm -hmm. And then we went on that trip to Napa. So this, I mean, we were 20, how old were we? Like 23? No, 25? <sighs> it was like, it's not important. Yeah, but yeah. we're in our mid-20s, right? Yeah. So, like, our first trip. To Napa, and we we had just had a baby, and so she was six months old. And we go on this road trip from Southern California. It's like six-hour drive up to Napa, and like tour all the wineries, and I mean as much as you could with the six-month-old. And she was really great. But then, like you know, you know when you're on road trips and you just have those like conversations, and you just like we love talking. And on I remember there was this turning point where like, what if I just jumped into this and this is what I did mm -hmm. and so then this whole trip was sort of like a soul searching like is this career searching like is this what I want to do right and one night we're like in our hotel room and our six month old was sleeping <laughs> in her playpen and Dave's like what if we just quit our jobs and like go Whoop. and pursue wine making yep. and I was like let's do it we can do it like I support you let's mm -hmm. do it and so then, I found a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so initially, so on the, now like six hours is on the way back that we're like planning it out. And for us, like if we plan something, like if we decide to do something, we make it happen. And so like I feel like that was like a point for us. We're like, okay, so. this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna do. And that theme has continued out throughout our marriage. Like if That's we true. decide and we know like this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna make it happen. Sometimes it takes a while to get to that conclusion, but once we decide right. and then we, we act, we act put fast. Our heart on it, we'll make it. Uh huh. And then. We ended up, um, yeah, pretty much like in six months, we decided like we in five actually it was five months, and we like quit our jobs, yeah. and then we decided initially we looked into UC Davis, but he had an undergrad in a bachelor of arts, and um, so they don't so they they don't allow postbacks. Yeah, so uh, and then I called Oregon State and uh, Dan Smith from. Uh, uh, Food science department answered and it's like Dan's like Dave, come on up. If California won't we'll, we'll accept you, we'll, we'll, we'll have you. We'll have you over here. Come on up to Oregon. It's like okay, Dan. Yeah, so that's how we ended up deciding to go to Oregon. Yep. And then like it was a great move because he loved now he like loves Pinot, loves sparkling, and like this is the place to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we moved up sight and seam. We go to Corvallis, like on the 34. Like you know, have you ever driven on the 34 straight into off Corvallis? of I-5? So we like grew up like suburban, like in Southern California and or in Canada too. But like this was the first time like experience like farm country. So we're like driving with all our stuff. He hadn't even been accepted into OSU. <laughs> we're driving into like through on the 34, and we're like, what? did we do like we're freaking out like oh my gosh this is like truly farm country yep. and then we got into Corvallis and it was it wasn't as scary as we thought it was scary Corvallis, Corvallis. Build, build, buildings and stuff right. yeah yeah people here right. and then we yeah. yeah and so then you ended up doing um prereqs at, pre at uh LBCC or LBCC yeah yeah and then and then yeah and then the rest of history and then I got the degree um but, uh, I mean, there was a lot of hard work. We had like another baby in between, and like you were going to school, and with two babies in between. We, well, while you're going to to um, so you're doing your prereqs to get into Oregon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, you got into Oregon State, and then had another baby in between. That's right. Yeah, but eventually you got your degree. Oregon's fertile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a guess. Yeah, yeah. We did not think we were going to have a third child, <laughs> but we're like. Everyone's doing it. We could do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then, then uh, yeah, that's. I think why. he's getting that's like a long-winded little bit. Yeah, but long-winded, but that's how he got this into it. This is this that's a, a a wonderful answer to that question. <laughs> so I want to back up for a second. I'm I'm curious. Yeah. Um, 
your, your first harvest, uh, obviously, uh, other than your first day, a little yeah. bit terrifying there. Yeah. Tell me about what it was about winemaking, about being around production that intrigued you. Sure. Um, I think uh, growing up in restaurant, I, you know, it was a hands-on work, but then I did mostly in the management side, more, mostly training the employee side. So it's more kind of a hands-on, but not really like, like physical, physical labor. I mean, some people might beg differ, but um, nothing like winery. And then playing music, you're out there playing music. It's more intellectual than I think, than like the physical aspect. So I, and then so when I started working on winery, especially during harvest, not knowing anything, just punching down just hundreds of bins, just you know, uh, just sweating bullets. And then somehow, like I really liked it. The back was breaking, but at the end of the day, I really liked it. And then um, after harvest, like there was a finality to it. Like ho however long, however crazy the harvest goes, it will end. You know, a lot of a lot of things in life, you know, we don't see the results or we don't see the end end product or you know things like that. There's, um, I like that like. Uh, the wine industry, uh, wine making has a little bit of that finality to it. Like this year, well, we're gonna bottle some next year and then the year after. It's rewarding. It's really rewarding, yeah. Like your hard work is, you know, comes in a bottle mm -hmm. and you can drink with, so nothing, you know. And like, I, growing up, I feel like he always sort of went against the grain. And so like, when he you was think? In, well, <laughs> <laughs> so like when he was in Korea, he told me like his teacher pretty much sat his mom down and said, we don't think he's a good fit for the Korean school system. It might be really beneficial if you guys like immigrate to the States or like send him for like... She, a, she really didn't like yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but I feel like that sort of foreshadowed, like he doesn't like to be boxed in. He doesn't like to um, be like... You know, and I, I feel like certain jobs, you know, you're doing the same thing every day. And like for him, I think that would just kill his soul if that's what you did all day. Yep. And so I, I feel like when we discovered wine, it's like, wow, like it's this, uh, you can use your creativity that he like expressed in his in music and, and then also using his, his brain and the science and then also just having that sort of, all that come together and then having a final product. And then each year it's just being, different and having these cycles where like you have that really rough harvest and mm -hmm. then you have a finished product and that rewarding like catharsis mm -hmm. yeah yeah and also I get bored easily yeah. as you can tell in my stories I've done tried different things I'm trying <laughs> to find out what I really like and you know do it for a long time but wine is just that it's so big it's so vast like you can't fathom it or like if think you know feel like you know how to do one thing and then it changes on you you know it's just not just making portion but it's coming from grapes coming from land you know whatever the the ear throws at you it completely changed your you know plan or strategy like your plan means almost nothing you know if like third week you know it's like oh third week of september it's like just start point all right bring everything in mm -hmm. you know you like being tough. and then i love when people say you can't do this uh, oh yeah. <laughs> and then I uh, challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, yeah. I'm curious what your perspective was, Lois, uh, from uh, outside the industry, but kind of with it. What What did you think of wine as as he was getting into it? Well, it's interesting because I grew up as a pastor's daughter, and so I grew up. I I married a Bible college student. So thinking that I was going to be a pastor's wife, so, then, so I mean, you can see how this sort of is a, quite a bit of a transition. Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, it's true. But I think in the end, I think, I mean, I love him so much. And so I, in the end, I think it's whatever he is passionate about. I really love my job and I'm, I'm a nurse practitioner. And I mean, it's my passion and I just, it's, so I, for me, it was really more so like, I just wanted him to find what he loved and was passionate about and so I think that's what sort of has had me support him because I mean like when he was in music I sang with him mm -hmm. <laughs> we're in a band together when he does wine like I jump in with him my best friend him. yes I'm doing all like the like oh. the TTB applications and like I do I love paperwork as a, so as like a, a director really of operation yes, right I have a title <laughs> director of operation. so so like it's written I mean for me it's like if what if it's something that he enjoys and is concerned about then mm. You know, I want to support him, but at the same time, like, I mean, it's wine making, it's wine, so like, what can I complain about? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Tell me about Oregon, the Oregon State program. Then tell me about your kind of f first foray into formal wine education. What what did you what did you expect? Maybe what was different, mm -hmm. and, and what did you kind of take away from it? Oh, okay, um, so I came to came back to school. You know, after working in the lab and in the, in the wine industry for a couple of years, mm -hmm. not long, but a couple of years, um, it was a like a it was a good transition. I think I, I already knew some of the things. You know. And I knew a little bit of why we're doing it, but it was really refreshing to actually know, oh, going through all those Gen Chem and the OCHEM, all that um, biology, microbiology, all, all those classes that you have to take, just really delving into, it was like, oh, this is exactly why this happens. Obviously, it doesn't answer all of my questions, but it answered enough for me to continue. Um, and then, and then continuing into Oregon, like uh, the Oregon State, um, just uh, taking classes, taking vit viticulture classes was really eye-opening too. Because I I grew up suburb, so like I'm I have nothing to do with farming. I didn't grow up near uh, farming at all. Well, I mean, I grew up near farming, but I never done it myself. Sure. Um, so like learning about the life cycle of the vine or how how like all those little things. The soil, the, you know, like what soil, like different types of soil. I know it's very basic, but like all those things, I didn't, I had no idea. I just knew, like, you know, I thought like, yeah, grapes, yeah, it's an agricultural product. You get grapes and then you make wine. You know, I just, because my experience up to that point was just solely on wine, uh, winery side, cellar mm -hmm. side. So just seeing that side, I was like, oh, this is way bigger than I thought it was. And just appreciating that side more um was i mean a huge takeaway for me i mm -hmm. think overall like mm -hmm. um education wise and then after that i i look for actively look for oh internship in in vineyard side also because i wanted to get my hands dirty and then just look for you know yeah learn more about it so tell me about, tell me about your first um work in oregon uh, inter yeah. internship and then from, and kind of go from there sure so first internship was, I worked with Steve <laughs> at Benton Lane. Mm -hmm. um, she was there every day. And then uh, also Mike Hammond and uh, Chuck Scondres. Um So I took this part of like relationship in like wine industry or like relationship is really key to me, like for me to get all the jobs <laughs> so far. Um, is I took a chemistry class from Mike Hammond, who, who, who's a winemaker now. Uh, not from, oh, you from Mike Kevin? Hmm? It was Mike Kevin that you took the class with. No, Mike's mom. Okay. Mike's mom. He was my yeah. She was my uh, uh, chemistry teacher, and then through her, I got a job at Bent Lane. Uh, this time paid, uh, and then <laughs> you learned your lesson. Yeah. So this <laughs> time paid, and uh, yeah, I went down. To, I mean, Monroe is you know only like 15, 20 minutes uh, from Corvallis which at the time we lived in Southern, uh, Southern Corvallis, which is like super close commute. And, um, and I loved everything about it. It's harvest, you, every, you know, pretty much same thing every day. You clean, you sort graves, you punch down, you process it, you, you know, you rack or whatever, and then you clean again, you finish part, you know, and then you do it again next day. Um, but I really like the camaraderie of it. Um, all those interns that year except me like all the interns had no winery experience so um it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> i remember that year being really like intense because this like as a lab tech you didn't really experience harvest you know like the, the right right downs and all that right and right. i remember when you came back from that i was like like he was tired like he would just knock out and then also just like she's saying yeah, I'm a weak sauce. <laughs> and then just no, but like it was well because you're he was in school, so he was yeah, like, yeah. working out or anything. And then I remember like the um, just the uncertainty of like when it's starting. Like I'm like, when are you starting? I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. Like they're they're gonna email me and tell mm -hmm. me when I'm starting. But I was like, don't don't you need, don't you know like exactly when you're starting? Like I just remember that being like no. And that was our intro into this is what harvest is. Right, right. <laughs> Plus minus two <laughs> weeks usually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that was my first harvest in Oregon. Um, met some great people. I still hang out with them. Um, 
And then, it's and on. then from there, like Chuck, you knew Chuck. That's how yeah. you got the job at Stoller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was your next job. Yeah. So it's all all relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Is Erica Erica Miller who is now the vineyard or the um, she's a viticulturist at Solar Wine Group now. Um, we hung out, so I I was hung, hanging out with Chuck, and then you know Erica came by, and then she was looking for an inter intern, and then I was looking for just that. I was looking for a vineyard internship mm -hmm. that year. I've done cellar a little bit about you know before, so I was like I want really want vineyard experience. So she was looking for a vineyard ex uh, intern, and I was like. If we can make that into a, you know, vineyard and a cellar internship, um, I'll, I'll be interested. And then we worked it out, and then it was a six-month-long, from June to December, um, internship at Stoller. It's, that's 2017. And, uh, and it just happened to be then that um, he had he needed to finish one more class to finish his degree. Right, right. But it wasn't offered till the next year, so he had this like. Term this time, so it was perfect timing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like I was working in Corvallis, and then and I you were pregnant, pregnant with Addy. With no, no, no was Lucas. Lucas. Thing there, yeah. yeah, Lucas. I was pregnant with our third, but he's like, he has to do this internship. So we, he ended up staying at the intern house there, and so six months, pretty much, we were apart, and we'd see each other like on the weekends. And mm -hmm. So that was an intense time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you worked at Argyle. Mm -hmm. um, and that was your, you were working at the cellar hand, and then after that, where were you? you and then you Duck went pond. to Duck Pond as yeah. well. Yep. Talk about Stoller first. I'm curious. That's a pretty big, a pretty different spot from from where you'd been before. And you're you're in the vineyard, kind of sure. primarily. Yeah. What, what did what was the kind of what did you learn from that that uh, you were maybe took away with from took away with you uh, from Stoller? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was first time, uh, you know, working in the vineyard. So. I didn't know anything, but Erica was patient enough <laughs> to walk me through step by step. This is what you do. So I kind of did uh, mostly uh, like like a vid tech would do. You doing like crop estimates, or you were doing um, where I'm doing like vineyard walks and looking for uh, disease disease. You know, like any signs of disease. Mm -hmm. Not that I could identify any of them. You know. But I had the couple pictures Erica sent me. He's like, look for these. <laughs> so I'm walking between rows, like 5:30 in the morning. This is barely sun sun's rising, and then I'm just walking every row. Um, and I just again once like it's just such a hard work that goes into farming. It's an appreciation of working the land is is no joke, really. Like everybody out there like in a hot sun you're just working all day you start early but it, it gets hot between rows it gets even hotter so just that uh, uh, that hard work you know, working like you know and then the work ethic like I learned that and um, it's really cool to see like how like grapevine as a like ph physiological like standpoint how they grow from bloom to like all the variation and all the getting you know ready and then like all this school knowledge became, you know, alive. That was really eye-opening and refreshing at the same time. All right, whatever I learned in school, you know, it was all like, you know, mm -hmm. waste. It was like really actually applicable and it was, it was worth it you know, to go through that, you know, in my 30s and, you know, with having kids <laughs> and <laughs> of a champion of a wife just sticking by me. That was, that was, that was great. And and also, I think another thing I want to mention is I lived in the intern house for six months, but I came, so I started living there uh, from June, but come August, like all the international uh, interns start arriving from Italy, from France, and then we just all lived together and um, they reminded me of like my travel to like Europe, like Italy and France and different parts and really um, that developing those kind of relationships. I still talk to them like almost daily on, you know, on Facebook or Instagram um, and s still keeping up with their lives and what they're doing, you know, going from here, what, you know, and then they're keeping up with my story. And then, you know, our story is kind of like intertwined like that way and then kind of, you know, kind of carries mm -hmm. on together. So mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, a very, you know, a lot of people say wine is very, like it's a very small world, it really is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see like people like all over the world still like, you know, with social media, it's super easy to talk to and keep in touch. And 
I really love him. You know, love that. I'm curious. At what point uh, did you did you have a vision for what you wanted to do? Did you have a vision for your own future, for your future together? Did you say, "This is what I want to do in wine"? Did, mm -hmm. At what point did that kind of become come into into fruition? Sure. So I grew up with a very you know like like entrepreneurial mom. I had own a as a single mom own a restaurant, you know. Um, so I have that in me, like growing up watching her, like I, in the end, like I know I want to do my own thing, um, have my own expression of some sort. Um, I mean, same reason I did music, songwriting. Uh, I want to have my say in this world. Um, but uh, so, but in, as, as far as wine uh, project goes, just working up until working in solar, I was just working and learning and having fun, um, riding around ATV and you know <laughs> having a lot of fun. Um, but it's uh, while working there, like trying different wines from everywhere. Um, it's like oh maybe they kind of like when we're having one of one of many like harvest parties mm -hmm. uh, or networking. I told Lois. <laughs> you always said I have to go network, but you've been networking with the same people <laughs> over and over. Yeah, and over. it just gets better every time. <laughs> Uh, um, and then that's when I, something clicked in me, like, oh, maybe I could do this. Um, I think a combination of like a few years of experience now under my belt, like, oh, I feel like oh, I'm getting a little bit of confidence. You know, not there yet, but I'm starting. To, I can start to think about, oh, baby, what if I, what if I do this? How would I do it? So that's when like 20, end of 2017 was kind of I've, the idea just kind of came to me. And then I was drinking a lot of bubbles at the time also. So, and then, oh, okay, Argyle. Mm -hmm. That's trying to get a job there. And through also a relationship, I got a, uh, they were looking for a person also. Mm -hmm. And then I now my way into <laughs> the Argyle world. But, I mean, you've always had like this, like wanted to do his own business because of that entrepreneurial, like sort of upbringing. Mm -hmm. But it's always been like, well, how? And for me, you know, we have three kids and I'm thinking like, how are we going to have our own business mm -hmm. and like live up in Oregon? Like this is going to be really hard because we didn't have any family up here. So it was just us. Right, right. And then, um, so we we're just trying to figure out how logistically how that would work. And so we went back and forth between like, should we do our own business? I want him to like do his own thing. Cause there, I mean, there's some frustrations like, you know, mm -hmm. when you're working for someone mm -hmm. and for him growing up in a, like in a restaurant. I love all my previous bosses. He, <laughs> he worked as we a all, We all do. Yes, yes. we all do. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you worked as a restaurant manager like for a while. And so like he, he loved like, I mean, telling people what to do. And so I think like, there was, some, we all? there was a little bit of a struggle there where like, so, I mean, so we went back and forth, but like, how are we gonna do our own business? Like how, without that family support? Um, so, I mean, you you know, like, as a winemaker, there's so many different routes. Like you could either go to school to be a winemaker. You could, you know, build up that experience and work your way up and become a winemaker. You mm -hmm. could have your own business. And so like, I think for us, it was just trying to figure out like where, how that would work for us. And mm -hmm. so then, eventually we figured it out and now we're gonna have our own label but yeah so i mean this conversation was like ongoing mm -hmm. all this time mm -hmm. yep but that's when it started happening mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so we'll get back to that in a second but i'm curious argyle like you said you're interested in bubbles you go to argyle tell me about that experience it's awesome <laughs> um and now i'm making bubbles uh um so i started there not knowing anything other than book knowledge how to make sparkling wine method champenois. And I started there working as a cellar hand. You know, I'm sure you already heard, like cellar work is 90% cleaning. So really good at cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> Not at home, but Except at the wine. At home, I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's what I said first. <laughs> I know. Well, who, who wants to do it at home if it's your job every day? Yeah. You can't, yeah. 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 But I cook though. But yeah, you yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we worked that out. But um, Argyle, um, so it's a whole new world, you know, Roland's been making Argyle from the 80s and now Nate's, uh, Nate's doing it. And just, you know, tasting through all the, all the you know, from, base, from the grapes when they harvest, you know, how like this ripping acid they ha have, you know, from their awesome vineyards. And then pressing it and then tasting that juice. And then, you know, doing alabage, like, 
tasting throughout the whole stage of uh, making uh, Mette Champenois was such a huge lesson and education for me because you don't get to do that uh, and it's, it's a long time uh, to do that so for me like to watch that process and then seeing how much more work <laughs> making bubbles uh, is on top of making still wines I got scared and then like all right maybe if I do it I'll, I'll just do sparkling mm -hmm. because that way at least my harvest will end early <laughs> You know, um, but Argyle just another you know it's a great place and they just great people and then we you know uh, to work for um, a lot of work. I mean everywhere is a lot of work, but it was Argyle is like very like how do you, how do you say it? Um, their their protocols are very in line, so they're very structured. Mm -hmm. So I learned that like small wineries I worked. Uh, can't name names, but there are not many. <laughs> but some wineries don't have that structure in place. Mm -hmm. You know, some sometimes they can't afford it. You know, so I had like a hose drop. You know, on my head. Well, you know, sometimes you hang the hose like you know like that, and then you just you know one you know you're standing on underneath and sometimes it falls in your head. And then, but but it was awesome to see like a big working for a big winery um, have all that in place. It was like thought out. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, very nice experience. And then, like your love for bubbles, sort of bubbles Grew, up. Yeah. That's oh. right, right? Oh gosh. <laughs> you can see why I'm a blogger. Yeah. <laughs> I do the social media. Yeah. I gotta do the dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, then my interest grew and grew, and then um, just through tasting and appreciating different styles of sparkling wine, and and then just like got more in, into it, you know. And then it's there, and I was like, oh, I need to find a way to make my own spark Mette Champenois. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then I was talking to my buddy Andrew, Six Speaks. Um, their family has been making sparkling wine for a while too. And then, oh, so I, we start the conversation while I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Andrew went to school with Dave at OSU. So oh that's yeah, how we you went. Guys knew each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess sort of you guys. Ended up hanging out. They ended up moving to McMinnville not too long after we moved to. They right? moved to McMinnville because of us. Yes. <laughs> For the so, record. I mean, we're, we're good friends, yeah. but but they also have a vineyard up in. I mean, their vineyards up in Hillsboro, really high elevation. The Shale and Mountains um, now and now Laurel. Laurel Wood, yeah. They just got Laurel Wood, yeah. Just sort of mint, newly minted. Is it is it a sub ABA. sub AVA? Yeah, yeah. Sub -AVA. brand new. Yeah, uh -huh. brand new. Um, um, and so, I mean, I feel like that sort of connection too um, mm -hmm. has sort of has been really great. Mm -hmm. we get to and yeah, I like, you know, a few money. times I tried their sparkling, I really liked it. And then also like, like, like a few like uh, OSU friends, we would go camp out in their vineyard sometimes. And then their vineyard is up in like a thousand feet elevation. This is perfect for, mm -hmm. perfect for sparkling. And then. I was thinking, I gotta talk Andrew into selling me some of his grapes. <laughs> I talked to his dad about it. Yeah. yeah. And it worked out. <laughs> so we have we have your kind of this kind of plan kind of coming in from a lot of different angles. You're you're developing a taste and sparkling, you're developing, you're thinking about this kind of small business. So tell me about taking the step and taking the plunge and, and, and tell us about what the, the project you have now. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I mean this I we can't explain this without talking about or move back to California because why are we making wine in Oregon? Why are we move to California? Right. Um, so all during all this time, I mean, we talked about not having that family support, but I really struggled with like seasonal depression, and so that was really challenging because we really wanted to make this work. And so for a year, it was like, okay, well, we'll try different things and try and make it work so we can stay. And so then we did, and we did lots of sun trips and other things, and um, and tried to take care of my mental health. And, and in the end, it ended up being too tough. And so we had to make this hard decision. Like I know, I re up till now, like I've been all on board. I want to support you in everything you do, but like in the end, I got to take care of my mental health. And he saw me struggle that year and really jumped up and said, "You know what? You're my priority." And so he has been really great. So that was sort of the reason why we ended up moving down to California. And so then um, we moved down, but you know sort of struggled with the idea, should I go back to the tomato wine industry? 
or stay with you know making wine in Oregon and we found that it was like the perfect opportunity to like pursue your own wine label because um, when we're in Oregon if I chime in uh, mm -hmm. or I had a full-time we both had a full-time mm -hmm. job I was working in a winery um, so this sparkling project was only going to be a side project mm -hmm. my hobby thing you know um, but I think it moving our us like moving to California to our son and family um, kind of propelled us to like all right now we actually have to make yeah. make this into a, a viable business and then I mean being in California too to be able to introduce like our wine to California mm -hmm. I think and there's being in Southern California there's a big market there too so being able to make it here and then also having a place to market it I think we sort of talked about how that would look and how it would work and then during harvest I won't see him anyway so he can come up for harvest True. so I mean and then I'd have my you know my mother-in-law my mom to help with, with the kids and so yep. so it just everything ended up sort of working out that way and so it's been good because it was sort of like as a married couple to have each other sort of support each other and for me to support him in his dream and then for him to help support me and be like okay well you you know you made the sacrifice I can make the sacrifice for you and so it's just been sort of rolling with the punches and mm -hmm. working out what's best for our family yeah and then Lois has been great doing all the TTB applications oh. <laughs> all the paperwork yeah. which I'm not really good at <laughs> I'm very detail oriented. Like I like to do like all the paperwork stuff. Yeah. And I mean like wine related, like he loves it. He'll jump in and do all that yeah. stuff. But as, if he needs to like put an online application in or like do the paperwork, he's like, here you go. <laughs> and I'm happy to do it. Just but, different strengths. Yeah, different strengths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the, about the timeline on the project then. Yeah. So um, right now uh, our all the, all our application it's like a Hans Zimmer movie is like <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, um, sorry I got distracted um, so TTP applications in they're reviewing so hopefully we get that out so we can bottle our 2019 Live Pinot Noir here like in September or so um, and next year so hope and then I'll make maybe five five to seven tons. Uh, this year of different skews, um, and then they'll, some of some of the whites and rosés and pet nat will be ready by early next next year, 2021, and uh, and then by the yeah, and the hopefully yeah by then we'll have our online shop and everything, and then less social distancing required, so I can actually go sell some, sell some wine. Right. Yeah. And our label is Cho Wines. Okay, Cho. That, was my that was my next question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so like, it, it, during all this time when we like, you know, when the kids are going to sleep, we talk about, you know, what are we going to name our label? And so we went back and forth between a lot of things. And in the end, we're like, why don't we just bear our name? And, you know, lots of families bear their own name. But what is, we sort of struggled with that, just being Asian and like, you know, well, people want to buy, you know, an Asian wine maker's wine, and so actually, this last year has been such a great sort of um, boost for us to you know, thinking about like just Black Lives Matter and just this whole movement and being a minority and just feeling empowered to um, push through with our brand and that we can proudly bear our name um, on our label. Mm -hmm. And there's a second meaning to it too, like C H O. You know, when you were in chemistry class, mm -hmm. you talked about like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All the time. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah. it. Yeah, I think you can, you can better explain yeah. that. Yeah. So like yeah. carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, like all living things have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Oxygen, whether it's like you and me, the food on our table, wine, the predominant elements are mm -hmm. carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So I feel like that sort of ties into our whole sort of theme and our um, experiences. Where like no matter where we go, everyone is connected. We mm -hmm. all, in the end, are just these these atoms come together. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, sort of trying to emphasize that. And let's celebrate the, you know, commonality, commonality rather than yeah. fight over differences. So that's sort of our philosophy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting you bring that up, because obviously there are not a lot of well-known Asian winemakers. Have mm -hmm. you had people have you had role models have you had people you've reached out to have there been people who've come to you wanting to do what you're doing 
not yet. <laughs> um, yeah, like you said, there. Uh, I don't think there are many like uh, examples yet. I don't in the. You're a good friend, like. Junichi yeah. Well, yeah. Wow. Other than like Junichi, mm -hmm. I don't know oh, if you know. I do know Junichi. Yeah, Junichi. Yeah, um, he's an awesome dude, and um, I think uh, really respect what he's doing, and we're kind of like cheering our, each other on. It's like, hey, we can do this. Um, him more of like a, from the growing perspective all the all the way into me like I'm no more like a modified version of that but we're kind of cheering each other on it's like hey let's do this mm -hmm. and then we can do it and kind of keeping each other like accountable but there aren't a lot of these no I mean, we've I mean I've looked too and <laughs> there aren't a whole lot no not um, yeah. so and or even Korean American I I don't think right maybe maybe a handful I'm not sure so oh, no. <laughs> If you know of anyone, let us know. <laughs> if you're watching this. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're excited though, like, um, um, like selling perspective, there are a lot of, you know, like Asian cuisine, like in general is kind of being highlighted recently and then a lot of higher end, like, you know, me being like a second generation, like a growing up, uh, like a restaurant kid, uh, like seeing a lot of second, third generation Asian uh, restaurant tours opening up pretty high-end mm -hmm. uh, tasting menu only kind of like restaurants or like some casual too but then there's doing some really amazing stuff nowadays so I'm excited also excited to like uh, partnering with them and uh, that's just my pipe dream but yeah. <laughs> they don't know I exist yet <laughs> yeah well, yeah it'll make it happen yeah that's right. But that's right I believe it yeah so <laughs> yeah so we're pretty excited excellent yeah so I, you asked before we started how I discovered your story, and I discovered it through the making of a winemaker site. So I'm curious, mm. what prompted you to do to want to do that, and, and if you've had any kind of feedback response from from the site. Well, you're probably your main feedback that we got. Was like, <laughs> people are actually reading the site, like <laughs> word for word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I really, I really like chronicling journeys, and um, I guess like when we, I mean, if you way back, like. We have all these blogs, blog, blogs from like when you were in seminary and like, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I just really like chronicling journeys. And so like thought, you know, if we're gonna make this happen, why don't we just start documenting it from early on? And so I think like when he was, actually when I started the blog was when he was at Stoller and I had all this time on my hands because he was gone. And so I was like, what do I do in the evening after the kids go to bed? I'm gonna start writing this blog. And so that's why it sort of got started. Mm -hmm. um, and then I love taking pictures too. And so, um, so yeah, I just thought that it would be nice to maybe somebody out there might want to be interested in our story. And there's one. And then, yeah. yeah, there you go. You're the meeting him. If we yeah. um, start our own business, I thought that it would probably be a nice like tool to have, or you know, just to have people know about us and know that we were serious about it from the beginning. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I thought that it, and it, hopefully it will be. <laughs> Hose dragger turned winemaker. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I still drag hoses though. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, specifically about the site, the kind of fam, the kind of the family aspect of it. Obviously, it's not just you; it's not just the two of you. You have a family. so tell me about kind of chronicling the family in the world of wine. Have you have you felt has it has it helped you in any way? Have you felt that it's accomplishing something for you personally or for the two of you? Yeah, just to feel like we're a part of it, but part of his journey, and um, just I guess um, yeah, just to feel, know that. It's all like I'm. I mean, just to say that I'm supportive of you and that I. This is. I don't know. I. I'm not sure if I have a good answer. To this I'm. I'm, I'm thankful. Yeah, this might be one that we cut out later. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. Like, could you clar yeah, clarify you your question? Clarify I'm just curious if like there's any kind of catharsis or any kind of self-help that comes from chronicling oh, yeah. the, the family part of things. Yeah, if, if it feels makes you feel more connected to each other or Maybe. to the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where you're going with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I didn't phrase it very yeah, well. No, definitely. Well, because it's, I mean, for us to have come up here, it was sort of a sacrifice in it, of itself, I guess. You mm -hmm. know, just because, I mean, for me, I have a ton of extended family in California and my parents and your mother and the, or my, your mom. Mm -hmm. and, so like it was like a huge decision to leave all of them and move up here move our, and all our friends and so I think sort of it yeah it was a little bit of a trying to justify like something's gonna come out of this there was a reason why we have left everyone mm -hmm. and it and mm -hmm. it 
I feel like it, we accomplished what we set out to accomplish when we moved yeah. to. Yeah, and that kind of actually helped us, like, it pushed us a little bit, like, you know, when we're having, you know, like, a rough day, like, oh, you know, we're here, like, away from, like, you know, we got to do this, we're going to make it happen. So it kind of gave us, gave us that little, little extra push, yeah. um, which is, you know, helpful. And then in hindsight, too, like, sort of on the opposite end of that, um, I feel like I, I felt a little bit of pressure, too, like, mm -hmm we moved up for him why are we moving back down to california and so mm -hmm. it was really hard for me to justify like moving back because just for me you know but because but I, we're a team we're yeah, family we're team. so and he's been so supportive yeah, you know and yeah go ahead. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no really. yeah no that's that's it yeah. so on the opposite <laughs> so end of that like i just felt like okay there was a little bit of pressure sort of on that side but then now like i'm feeling like this was the right decision and really in the end it the timing of it couldn't have been perfect because we actually arrived on the day of California lockdown. Oh. So like three hours before the governor <laughs> announced lockdown is when we arrived and we're like, we are so glad <laughs> we mm -hmm. made it down mm -hmm. at this time. And just even like having your mom, we're living with her right now. And so, mm -hmm. um, so just that support having her is really yep. good. Yep, that's yeah. huge, yeah. And we're up here talking, talking with you because grandmas are watching the kids. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. So I feel, yeah, I feel catharsis right now. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I, I, I enjoyed your guys' kind of initial description of driving to Corvallis and, and having the kind of the like farm country yeah. realization. But I'm curious what your first in impressions were of Oregon as an industry. Like, what did you think of Oregon wine industry? And has that changed from what your first impression to now? Sure. Uh, I think. The wine side, it was kind of a little bit different, you know, we, we grow a lot of, you know, thick skin grapes down there, to, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, what, you know, whatever you name it, uh, but, and then up here, Pinot, obviously, and Chardonnay, you know, um, but as far as like wine and culture wise, Temecula, I, I'm not from Napa or Sonoma where like gigantic, you know, wineries are. Like I'm from Temecula, which is also a kind of like a subset of California ABA, you know, very small, small um, region. So everything wasn't like, you know, the wineries aren't that, that big, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So from there to, I guess, my first internship at Ben Lane was kind of a, kind of like a little bit of seamless actually. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a pretty good transition. And then, but I do think uh, we have uh, less Hispanic, people working in the cellar in Southern California, like most of the cellar workers are Hispanic mm -hmm. uh, workers, um, but up here, like, you know, non-Hispanic, you know, mm -hmm. people and one Asian, one Asian kid <laughs> working in the cellar. Yeah, there was not as much diversity. Yeah. Um, is that what you're being for? <laughs> no, the initially, the initially, uh, like, you know, I mean, cellar transition was uh, seamless, but I, I, that's what I noticed, but I guess, and people are people like you work you know you work hard and then you work towards one goal which is to f process all these grapes uh as fast as we can um so that camaraderie is similar you know we you know everyone you know working hard and yeah mm -hmm. i don't know what else to add but <laughs> <laughs> so like oregon wine industry what do you think um oh like not just the first impression it's awesome to have family here now uh, because, you know, just coming up here sight unseen to Corvallis and just scared to like fast forward six years. We have all these wine industry folks that are, you know, we started all, we all started as a interns and, and then we like, we're like coming up in ranks. So we're all working, you know, towards our goal, like our individual goals and, you know, and just watching not just myself grow, but like to like see all my friends, you know, they they are all growing, like, you know, maturing in the industry, like that is awesome to see. And then I'm picturing like oh, 10, 20 years from now, that we'll all be like, just hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> be all those rock star winemakers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, I love, I love, I love the community. I love that uh, the friendship. I love that uh, the the tight knit relationship that we share, mm -hmm. and then we can just uh, talk about anything. Uh, I like that casual aspect of like we talked about Oregon wine industry. I, I 
I, I love that. Yeah, there isn't a whole lot of like compass. Like, There's yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Then then that person won't be invited next time. There's a lot of authenticity. Yeah, yeah. What about as you look ahead for Oregon wine? First, uh, what, what do you see happening in the industry over the next, say, five, ten years? Oregon, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, that I continue to make Oregon wine, you know, traveling back and forth from California, part of that is friends here also, but part of it is I, I truly believe that Oregon wine will be a lot more famous than now and that a lot more people will appreciate the quality mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I truly believe that. That's why I don't mind traveling out of here. What kind of wines do you feel like are going to be highlighted? What do you mean, what kind like of? Like uh, sparkling. Oh, <laughs> oh, I mean. Sparkling. You're talking about Chardonnay too, right? You think yeah, so? I mean, sh sh Chardonnay, I mean, the, you know, big three, right? You know, I mean, big two, I guess. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. I mean, and then Pinot Gris is kind of like unfashionable right now, but some people are making it into some other creative ways to like skin contact or pet net. Um, so hopefully Pinot Gris bounces back. Um, but it's just like unparalleled quality. Like if you. Um, if you buy a, a $20 bottle of anything, like especially Pinot Noir, uh, like if you do side by side with a lot of different regions, not knocking them off, but it's really hard to compare like with the consistency and the, you know, the quality that Oregon produced, like it's, it's unparalleled to me, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. What do you think that is? Whew, good question. What is, what's special about Oregon for Pinot Noir or for Oregon wine? In, in, in scientific way, like, t like t talking numbers, like Oregon Pinot Noir comes in like perfect chemistry, like almost every time, like three, around 3.5 pH and like, like 7, 8 pA. It's just amazing me, like amazes me to see that from like working at like working from like different like you know from working like different wineries and different climates before like really hot regions also like wines coming in at like 4.0 pH and you have to do I guess in that sense you don't have to manipulate as much to lower the pH down or you know, stuff like that we do minor adjustments you know for you know, according to what uh, your wine needs uh, but it's just the raw material sorry it took me a while but <laughs> you got there. the raw material <laughs> The quality, that's why I appreciate the farming aspect over here because the raw material that we get is just crazy. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Perfect. Like it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned obviously uh, getting home to California or getting back to California just, just in the nick of time. Yep. Um, effects of the pandemic, uh, how have they affected you on a professional level and have, how have they affected maybe your vision of the future for, for yourselves and for the wine industry? I think we'll have to work hard as a wine seller now to sell to restaurants and because I'm also working at my mom's restaurant to pay for things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I see some restaurants doing okay, but a lot of restaurants struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has sort of, you know, going in, you thought about, you know, marketing or, or um, selling to different restaurants, um, direct to consumer. And so for us, um, seeing sort of like the huge hit that restaurants are taking, it definitely does put a little bit of a, um, puts a little worry in our minds, but also seeing like how direct to consumer is gonna be like- It actually like, went it, up. Yeah, it's, yeah. Gonna, it's gone up. And so um, just to sort of, have, I think we, that's where we're aiming towards to do a lot more direct to consumer and hopefully but yeah, it's it's tough, like just not knowing where restaurants are going right now and how mm -hmm. long this is going to last. And mm -hmm. Luckily, I feel like we're starting now rather than like a couple of years ago because I think then uh, financially it yeah, would have been a lot harder. It would have been sure. a lot tougher for us, and so so we can sort of gauge where we want to launch off right now. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that's been a challenge, and then also even just traveling, like up here, you know. 
with cases rising in, in California, trying to make sure that we're staying safe and um, doing our part. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, we have to do, we have to work and mm -hmm. make this work. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, you in medical yeah. and yeah. Um, I also, like, I'm a little bit optimistic because, you know, even through this pandemic, people want to go out and eat and, you know, um, they want to drink wine. They, they drink absolutely want to drink, want to drink wine. wine. So, well, hopefully, more people <laughs> will be drinking more wine at home and then, you know, growing their palates and then learning about Oregon wine. And hopefully, there's going to be a little bit more of a um, presence, too. And I don't know, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> But drinking wine in the restaurant is really fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's just a different ambiance, right? So, um. so what about the future for the two of you? Obviously, you're just getting started on this new project. You're just getting started back in a, in a back at home, I guess. We'll, yep. we'll say it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you see as you look ahead for yourselves for, for and for Cho Wines uh, the next five to ten years? So we're obviously just starting out in a very very small label. Uh, but hopefully, uh, me coming over here, like for you know, for harvest and making, you know, making my wine, and then making numerous trips up to Oregon to uh, to uh, to attend the, the critical points uh, of winemaking, and then Lois and I doing more more travels, and then hopefully, again, this pandemic will will come, vaccine will come out, and then we'll be able to travel more freely, and then hang out with people, that's what we do best, and making relationships, making that relationship with that restaurant person, like a, uh, the bottle shop person, you know, and then making that lasting relationship. I, I think selling wine is fun, but also, you know, building that relationship is, you know, what's lasting and then what gives me more joy, actually, and the wine is just a vehicle. It's just, a, you know, hey, I can brag a little bit. Hey, this is a bottle I made. You want to drink? You want to try? You know, I like that. But at the end, it's the relationship that I crave. It's the community that I crave in from inside. So that's why I'm trying to do that. And then hopefully, five, ten years, hopefully we make more wine. Hopefully I can pay for myself one day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, we're, we're, it's a humble start. So we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to like a angle just yet but we'll right right yeah. right right we're, obviously we're gonna see where it takes us sure. um, yeah. yeah but i i think it's yeah i think that's the thing like the community aspect is huge for us like yeah i think this is his way to stay connected with his friends in oregon and yes. the, in the industry and yes. so that's for his mental health too I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's important yes it's important okay. yeah as you as you grow, are there things you have in mind that you'd like to try? Are there different varietals you want to work with, or different styles you want to do as you as you're growing? Yes, uh, rock Syrah. Yeah, I want to. I want to make some, but I can't just ask for like. A, can I just buy one one ton <laughs> and truck it all the way over here? Um, so once I become a little more sizable, I can do a few tons at a time. I'll, uh, recently, uh, right before, I don't know, was it right before as it was starting, me and a few of my buddies uh, went to Walla Walla and then we did some tasting and I just fell in love with, it was my first time going out there and just I just fell in love with uh, Rocks Raw. Mm -hmm. Man, one day, I can make some, yeah, that Cote Verde style, yeah, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> and this next year, so we're doing, you know, um, so we're doing so Pinot Noir, uh, the Blanc de Pinot, and then gotta have rose, mm -hmm. and then some Pat Nat, and then uh, some sparkling. We'll see. Yeah. Let's see. Yo. As you've been looking for for grapes, uh, have there been specific vineyards or or types of vineyards you've been looking for? Mm -hmm. So this year, the last year also, and this year, we're making, uh, we're getting grapes from Andrew's parents' uh, property up in Shalem Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, awesome vineyard, it was planted in, back in 81. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's got some age. Um, and then, just delicious. So uh, they got, this year I'm getting uh, all my grapes from there. Um, hopefully, I wanna expand, expand the program a little bit next year and then get some Chardonnay from Yola, mm -hmm. Emily, um, 
and uh, yeah. Yes. Excellent. Uh, last question for you. Uh, if someone were to ask you for words of wisdom or advice on getting into the Oregon wine industry, what would you tell them? Either of you, both of you. Jump in. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Go Quit harvest. Your <laughs> do, quit your job. Yeah, quit your job. <laughs> yeah. Winemaker. That's right. Yeah. yeah, jump in. It's the best way. Immerse yourself. Go 100%. Do a harvest. Don't volunteer. Get paid. <laughs> Get paid. <laughs> I, I still stand by my decision at that time. <laughs> yeah, but really, I think it's such a friendly um, industry, like, mm -hmm. like up here. I mean, I feel like if you are passionate and you have the heart, like people are open arms. They, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you work hard. <laughs> you work hard. You play a little bit harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if you stick around like 10 years, you'll make your way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, wait, I feel like 10 years is like the number. I don't know how long it's been for you right now. But like, Smart. if you just like, my year if you nine. stick around in any yeah. profession, 10 years, you yeah. will, you'll be somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. Spending time and just sticking around. That's mm -hmm. all the questions that I have for the two of you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover today that we should have covered? Kind of your open mic at the end here, so. Open mic. My, that's why I brought my guitar <laughs> over here. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, we're we're no. glad that you contacted us. Thank we, you, yeah, yes. Fun time. Excellent. I'm so glad. Thank you both for, for hosting us here and for sharing your stories. Yeah. And uh, best of luck on your fledgling business here. And awesome. we'll let you off the hook. Yeah, thank you.